Hi all, I'm Xavier. Today, I'm back with another sharing. Alright, it's going to be a commonly asked question by my client. If I'm single 35, near 35, should I buy a resale HDB or dive straight into the condo market? Okay, this is very common and I feel moving forward as Singaporeans may get married later, uh, this will be on top of everyone's mind. Okay, um, I've got actually a very good chart that I'll show you later that summarizes everything and can help you make very good decisions right on the spot. Uh, but before I do that, maybe let's, uh, let's, let's talk a bit about the uh, HDB market that has been making a lot of news recently. Okay, this recent one, in fact, it was just up uh, at business time. Okay, the five-room flat at uh, Bukit Merah, Buntiong to be exact, has been sold at a record of 1.59 mil. Right, crazy, isn't it? Because it eclipsed the previous one uh, the, at the DBSS at uh, Topayo. So this one, it coincides with the, with the two mil asking price listing that circulated around social media. But I think this listing has been taken down. So what is causing HDB prices to be um, still so elevated? Uh, if you ask me as a practitioner on the ground, more of the demand are coming as a uh, better located. Uh, HDB flats and actually I briefly mentioned this one and a half years ago when the prime housing model uh, came about in my sharing I'll just put the link below that you can check it out okay essentially it's just demand that is deviated from people who are looking at this prime housing model BTOs um, and because of this very strict rules and regulated uh, regulations that are related to it and cause the demand to be deviated to the existing resale HDBs. Okay, I this is around already one and a half years ago. I think the demand has been coming through since then. It may be tapering down from what I've been seeing in the market um, or constantly on the ground 24-7. Uh, but I, I feel they're still searching for equilibrium, which I'll be talking about uh, shortly. From the policy maker, it's, it's just a short-term pain versus a long-term gain, right? You have to come up with something to make sure that HDB will be continually affordable down the road. But I mean, you, you can't have it, can't have this prime housing model on existing resale flats because it's going to be unfair because you're going to look at it retrospectively and you don't know when to start because there might be people who bought it one uh, to five years just before that or you have people that bought it way from day one and still holding on to it so i guess it's only fair for the prime housing model to be affected on new bto's uh, that's going to come up so what this um uh what this resulted is that demand when they look at some of these stringent re uh, requirements restrictions or rules that you call it uh have cause the demand to be deviated to the current resale HDBs. So what are some of these rules and regulations? Let me, let me briefly talk about it over here. First up would be the 10 years MOP. Okay, the minimum occupation period being 10 years is very stringent. It's a double of the current five years. Uh, what MOP means is that you cannot sell the place, you cannot do upgrading. Even if you want to pay the ABSD, you cannot do it. If you include the building period of four years, maybe average three to five years, I'll just put it four years, it's 14 years of, of, of weight in this current house that you can't do anything. That's if, even if you accumulated a massive amount of wealth and want to buy another second property, you can't do it. Okay, so this is very stringent. It takes 14 years, it's a large part of our good prime uh, uh, age, right? But the second stringent one, which I think it's very draconian, is that you cannot rent out the, your unit even after MOP. So it just means that HDB want it to be just a roof over our head. No more looking at it as an investment. All right, this is very strict. So that's the reason why I guess people, when they are buying uh, the, the current resale flat at better locations, you know, they, they do factor that, that maybe if they're going overseas, they're going to buy a second one, they can still rent this uh, this flat out. As compared to the new ones, you know, you can't do it all together. The, the third rule is that there is a clawback on the subsidy. Okay, with some of this coming up since one and a half years ago, okay, there's some light about what kind of uh, clawback. I, I'm looking at some of the uh, clawback on subsidies online on some of these Queenstown, Kalang, Wampo launchers, there's around the 6% mark. It doesn't seem a lot. I mean, if you factor in a foreign flat that should comfortably sell above one mil, one mil 10 years down the road, you're looking at less than 100k. Uh, but the fact that you're taking money out of people's pocket, uh, however little, is still painful. 
Okay, so the fourth one is the eligibility for for flats after each the 10 years MOP. They still have the same eligibility criteria as when you're buying the new one. So it kind of means that your future buyer will be very limited with their budget because they still have to adhere to the income ceiling. All right. As of now, the income ceiling, of course, is 14K. Maybe by then it should increase. But because of this cap, it also means that perhaps the price in the future will not rise as much because the future buyers of your property uh, must be very cash rich. All right, if you have a certain cap because that will limit the amount of loan the person can get. So these four rules and regulation, I feel it's very, very draconian in, in that sense. And then uh, it's deviating, of course, demand for the current uh, resale flats. So when will it stop? I, I, I do see some signs on the market that the demand is slowly drying up. Okay, that coincides with the supply of these new BTOs and through the entire Singapore receiving keys. Lah. So what it means is that, you know, current flat owners who applied for a second BTO, as the completion comes on stream, they do have to sell their current flats. So when there's more supply also means there's more competition around uh, for these resale flats. So it's a combination of demand slowly drying up and also more supply. I think we are slowly finding an equilibrium. Secondly, also with launches of this uh, prime housing model, BTO being a norm, I think people are also getting used to it altogether because there's not much choice. For these resale flats around, yes, okay, usually when you see all the crazy record above a million, you know, uh, all, all these flats, their lease are all very new. They are all just MOP units. But some of the prime ones, even Buntiang one, if I'm not wrong, should be around 10 years old or so. These lists are also slowly coming down. So buyers are also starting to be very discerning when they start to compare with all these things. If I'm going to pay this X amount of money as compared, you know, even though their rules are very strict, but I'm still getting a brand new flat altogether. So all these things are coming to people's mind and, 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 and weighing, so till they're weighing their options, I think we are slowly finding equilibrium in that sense. The next point, why I think it will come to a stop is of course the pricing. You see uh, all these recent BTO launches, the pricing is around 700,000 plus max for a four-room flat. As compared to the, to the current one, the resale HDBs that is in a good location, they are above a mill, the, the gap is getting bigger and bigger. You will come to a point whereby people will be thinking it's unaffordable. Why not I just go for the BTO and I mean this cheap, it's just a roof over my head. Lastly, an important one, not many people talk about, and it's a bit of a black box, is the HDB valuation. HDB valuation, when a buyer buys a resale flat, you know, when they submit for valuation, HDB got a panel of valuers that they all engage, right? So I don't know how it works, but I feel that if HDB really want to keep a tap on the pricing, uh, they might, I mean, ask the valuers to come out to value the flat lower because it causes the cash over valuation, the COV, the biggest topic when they are buying their, their flats to be higher. So COV does affect um, a buyer's ability to buy because it means there's more cash down. If HDB really wants prices to be kept low, they have the valuers value the property lower in that sense. right? So with all these things happening, I think we are soon uh, reaching an equilibrium between uh, the current resale flats and this prime housing model BTO demand. Alright, okay, so I hope that explains, I uh, give you a quick understanding on the HDB market. So back to our question, why should I buy a resale HDB or should I buy a private condo? Okay, here you have the chart that I, I mentioned earlier. Alright, comparing the price trend between the resale HDB and the resale condo. Since 20 years ago, you can see the dotted line okay, between the blue line, which is the private condo market, and the pink line, which represents the resale HDB market, the dotted line in between is the difference in their per square foot pricing. Okay, it's evident over here, the difference in per square foot pricing since 2003 up to now has always been increasing from 290 PSF to now above 1,001 per square, per square foot. 
Okay, and I took it at five years interval, and you can see even at different, you know, world events, the 2008 period, or even in the current uh, period whereby you, HDB prices is very, very elevated, the difference has always been increasing. From an investment monetary point of view, it definitely makes sense for you to go into the private market as soon as possible if you have the ability to do it. Well, I cannot really ass assess your, your own needs because everybody's case is different. So that's why I'm looking purely from the investment monetary point of view. Okay, the earlier you enter, the more gains you make in comparison if you have, if you have entered into the HDB market. So another way of looking at it is that your buying power decreases over the years, let's say if you choose the HDB market. And the opportunity cost in that sense also increases if you want to upgrade in the future because let's say if you go into the HDB market, the 5 years MOP, 10 years MOP, it only means that your buying power decreases, your opportunity cost increases. And this is also amplified by your loan tenure uh, that decreases as you age. Do remember that. Of course, you can cover that with more cash, but the point of property is also the form of how much uh, leverage you can get, right? This chart really explain uh, from the per square foot pricing, the difference in pricing. Uh, I, I hope it's clear. Okay, another one that you can look at is I took out this uh, price, the total price quantum between the HDB flat, private condo, and private landed. Okay, since 20 years ago, the price gap. But if you look at the HDB flat, right, you, I mean, one can be happy because your prices have went up by 150%. But if you look at the private condo and private landed, you'll be a little bit more envy because the percentage went up more and of course the quantum went up even higher. Right? I mean, it's hard. I usually tell people it's hard nowadays or quite impossible I mean, to upgrade from a HDB market to a private landed. You can do it maybe 10 years ago, but not now if you don't have funding, you don't have external help, you don't have a certain windfall. It's just, it's just harder and harder to to, to get to get there right also one way of looking at this is if you have the ability to cash out you're looking at it you're looking at property and building your asset your nest egg uh, and you want to cash out in the future definitely by going on to the private market as early as possible will allow a, a higher ability for you to cash out with a more tidy sum of money so you look at this 2003 to 2023 example if you are the private condo market, if you have upgraded then 20 years ago, and of course by the time you are 55 to 65, I assume that you have fully paid up the, the property with inflation and everything at 1.87 mil. If you dial size and fully pay up and you fully pay a HDB flat, right, you still have at least 1.2 million in your pocket in that sense. And this is a good tidy sum to retire, notwithstanding any other funds you have, stocks you have, CPF you have, right? So uh, this can be a good example uh, to, to look at things if you are deciding between uh, these two products. All right, I hope this gives you a quick understanding of the market, a quick understanding of how you can look at things to decide, right? So thank you for your time and I'll see you for the next one.